I think I'll always be finding something new that I want to do. It's just it's who I am. I just want to do. I have to have something that I'm passionate about and that I'm focusing on in order to be happy. Though he would later struggle with the nature of his fame as well as market expectations, 50 Cent endured substantial obstacles throughout his young yet remarkably dramatic life before becoming the most discussed figure in rap, if not pop music in general, in the mid 2000s. Things you go through turn you into who you are. You're a collage of your experiences. Following an unsuccessful late 90s run at mainstream success and a successful run on the New York mixtape circuit, Eminem signed 50 Cent to a seven-figure contract in 2002 and helmed his quick rise toward crossover success in 2003. I love 50 Cent. I call him the Black Elvis Presley. The product of a broken home in the rough Jamaica neighborhood on Queens, New York, 50 Cent lived everything most rappers write rhymes about, but not all actually experience. Criminal activity. People enjoy the action. Drugs, crimes, imprisonments, stabbings, and most infamously of all, shootings. It's not how many times you get down, it's how many times you get up. If 50 Cent was a superhero, then the shooting was the creation myth. It's the moment where Peter Parker gets bitten on the neck by the radioactive spider. 50 Cent may have fit the mold of a prototypical hardcore rapper, but he could also craft a catchy hook. As a result, his music crossed over into the pop market, appealing to those who liked his roughneck posturing and rags to riches story, as well as those who liked his knack for churning out sing-along club tracks. He's contributed great work over the years. He's contributed absolutely brilliant work. 50 Cent has lived by his own notorious words, get rich or die trying. So you don't give up based on it being rough. You work through it. This is his remarkable story. Music, I think, is What's, what's really amazing about it is how it breaks language barriers. You know, because some of the people who were out there last night don't speak English. You know, and it's, it's interesting how they'll come and enjoy the festivities and everything's exciting. And for me, everywhere I've been, it feels like hip hop culture is now pop culture. It's everywhere, it's so broad. You know, originally it was something that was in New York, you know, and it grew outside of that. And, it's everywhere. So, you know, I was blessed with being there to kind of experience some of the early stages of it. So, um, not actually be participate, but be influenced by it and have it, you know, play around me from when I was really small. And now, um, it's exciting to, to, to go and do different things in film and to develop interests in different areas in art and have the ability to go after it is it's amazing. It feels great. Everybody that you talk to uh, potentially has a story to tell. Uh, they're an individual. Uh, and if you treat them with, uh, with some modicum of professional courtesy and respect, and you try and hold a conversation rather than go into a situation with a kind of a checklist of things and you just want to tick items off on a box, you may get information, but you won't get a sense of who the person is that you're talking to. So I try and hold conversations with interviewees. And uh, as such, I, I'm very rarely surprised to find people uh, uh, diffident or, or uh, stonewalling or unpleasant or argumentative or hostile. Uh, 50 Cent in that regard was no different to the, the vast majority of people that I get to talk to on a on a day by day, week by week basis. He's, uh, he's an interesting guy. He's done some interesting stuff. He, there's nothing in his life that he's particularly unwilling to talk about. I guess if you were to press him on his thoughts on who it was who shot him, you might find him clamming up a little bit. But most other subjects, he's uh, not necessarily an open book, but he's someone who's uh, warm and engaging and uh, intelligent and interesting. I wasn't particularly surprised that he was any of those things. Uh, and I found him to be all of those things. My first expectations of looking after 50 Cent, I thought it would be a lot harder than it was. I thought it would be a lot more difficult and he wasn't at all, he was, he was very easy going. The paparazzi and the guests outside were actually more problematic than the artists and his guests themselves. Okay, 
50 Cent is so relaxed when he looks at a venue. We had him in a venue where there was a hole in the VIP wall. It was, it's always there. But he looked at the DJ box and he just decided he was going to make his way to the DJ box, not thinking about the crowd or any risks. So I've had to sort of pull him back, ask him where he's going, and then put my security forward of him. So when he goes through and the crowd comes in, he's still safe. And it was really busy, so it was well worth doing. I wish I could take you all to the neighborhood where I grew up in Jamaica, Queens. We see families struggling to get by, parents working two and three jobs just to make ends meet, kids staring at adversity day after day. But we also see hope, we hear music, we witness dancing and laughter in the streets and the storefronts because New York City, that's what we are, baby. This is the city of dreams. Curtis James Jackson III was born and raised in the South Jamaica neighborhood of Queens, New York City. He was raised by his mother Sabrina, who gave birth to him when she was 15. A cocaine dealer, Sabrina raised Jackson until she was murdered when Jackson was 8. She lost consciousness after an unknown assailant drugged her drink. The assailant then turned on the gas and closed the windows of her apartment. Being deprived of a mother in black America is actually a really horrible thing because normally it's, it's, it's mothers who actually take care of the kids and the dads leave. I think hip hop's one of those uh, genres where the uh, formative experiences of the artist are of pivotal importance. Hip hop tends to be stories taken directly from the life. If not your own life, then the life of people that you knew, friends around you, uh, things that you saw happen in the neighborhood. So clearly, anyone who's had the kind of life story that, uh, that, that Curtis Jackson had in, in the early part of his life is not gonna want for material when it comes to writing. Uh, this, this definitively and very uh, often uh, deliberately autobiographical music. After his mother's death, Jackson moved into his grandparents' house with his eight aunts and uncles. At age 12, Jackson began dealing narcotics when his grandparents thought he was at school. In 1994, Jackson was arrested for selling four vials of cocaine to an undercover police officer. He was arrested again three weeks later when police searched his home and found heroin, 10 ounces of crack cocaine, and a starting pistol. Although Jackson was sentenced to three to nine years in prison, he served only six months in a boot camp. The whole thing about selling drugs is a whole mode of survival. It's a method of survival. It is really the people who are selling drugs and the people who certainly were selling drugs, I don't know about now, but certainly in 50s time, the people who were selling drugs were forced to sell drugs by their circumstances. And it's not out of hatred for their fellow man either. It's just economics. I've always had to be two people growing up. I had to be aggressive enough to get by in the environment and then be my grandmother's baby when I got in the house. Like, we wasn't even allowed, we weren't allowed to curse or do anything that my grandparents felt were inappropriate. They were real old fashioned people. So uh, I'm both of them, but under circumstances where a person is making me uncomfortable or I'm in a threatening situation, you see 50 Cent show up, but I spend more time functioning like my grandmother's baby right now. In 1995, Curtis Jackson decided to trade crime for hip hop. Jackson began rapping in a friend's basement where he used turntables to record over instrumentals. In 1996, a friend introduced him to Jam Master J of Run DMC, who was establishing Jam Master J Records. J taught him how to count bars, write choruses, structure songs, and make records. 
In 1999, after Jackson left Jam Master J, the platinum-selling producer's Trackmasters signed him to Columbia Records. They sent him to an upstate New York studio where he produced 36 songs in two weeks. 18 were included on his 2000 album, Power of the Dollar. You were locked down in the studio for two weeks. You came up with 36 songs. Um, when you thought about bringing the human together with truth, was this something that you thought about as far as a marketing strategy, or was this something that you just felt in your heart? It was something I just felt. Okay. You know, like, it wasn't even about marketing strategy. Like, I, I feel like right now it's a little harder for an artist to come out by itself, like, without being affiliated with a camp, like he's not down with Rough Riders or not down right. with Cash Money or not down with any other cliques that's, like, Death Squad or somebody that can co co sign them. Like, you know what I'm saying? 50 Cent is just... It's me, it's 50 Cent, you know what I'm saying? It, it's a metaphor for change. I'm going to make some changes. I'm going to do it myself. I just got to give him records that's undeniably hot. Jackson's popularity began to grow after the successful, controversial underground single, How to Rob, which he wrote in a half-hour cab ride to a studio. Let's talk about How to Rob. Um, that, that was by far to me. <laughs> that was like one of the funniest, most truthful songs, man, that I've ever heard. How, how did you actually come up with that concept, and how long did it take you to write that? I, 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 like, I used the format from Biggie's Dreams of Sex and the R&B Chick. Okay. Like, I, I used that format, and I did what, like, because the jewelry is becoming a part of hip-hop. Like, it's like, it's symbolizing your success right now. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, it, like, the bigger artists got bigger diamonds now, you right. know what I'm saying? So, that's, like, that's why I came along the lines, like, when Big was thinking dreams of sex and R&B chick is because, like, I think R&B music is sexy, regardless even if the artists aren't attractive. Like, like, what do you do when you listen to that music? Uh -huh. You know what I'm saying? So I'm thinking of a way, you know, to do it in my angle, like my way, how I could do it, and I came up with How to Rob. You know, and just that's the way I brought it to the yeah. table. The track comically describes how he would rob famous artists. Rappers Jay-Z, Big Pun, DMX, Wyclef Jean, and the Wu-Tang Clan responded to the track, and Nas invited Jackson to join him on his Nastradamus tour. 50's willingness to rap openly and brashly and the attention How to Rob attracted would come back to haunt him. Beef to me is a different thing. Beef is when you're in an actual altercation with a person or when you're actually going back and forth with each other and, it, and it's violent. It's when they're actually past the point of art or saying anything to each other. It's like, no, when they see you, something's going to happen regardlessly. You know, like that's what beef is. On May 24, 2000, just before Columbia was set to release Power of the Dollar, an assassin attempted to take 50 Cent's life, shooting him nine times with a 9mm pistol while the rapper sat helpless in the passenger seat of a car. One shot pierced his cheek, the other his hand, and seven others his legs and thighs. Yet he survived, barely. With 2020 hindsight, he was shot over how to rob. That's that's just how it goes. It's the late, it's the nature of jealousy and things like that. If you like, if 50 Cent was a superhero, then the shooting was the creation myth. It's the moment where Peter Parker gets bitten on the neck by the radioactive spider. It's the point where uh, an ordinary person. Uh, becomes this sort of superhuman, superhero figure within the hip-hop landscape. It, it gave him a story and a power source to draw on that he, uh, he set him apart from all of his peers and all of his competitors. After hearing the news, Columbia Records wanted nothing to do with 50, shelving power of the dollar and parting ways with the now controversial rapper. And that, I think, uh, from talking to him seems to have been the defining moment and that was the point where he decided okay so I've been a victim of a crime and as a victim of a crime uh, they're ditching me. I mean I could have understood it if I'd gone out and shot somebody uh, and they decided they didn't want to have anything more to do with me but I was the one that was shot and they still threw me away and he wanted to make sure from that point on that that would never happen again. 
It took 50 Cent just five months to fully recover from the shootings. When he left the hospital, he stayed in the Poconos with his girlfriend and son, and his workout regime helped him develop a muscular physique. As well as being dropped by his label, 50 was also blacklisted by the recording industry. Unable to work in a U.S. studio, he went to Canada, where he recorded over 30 songs for mixtapes to help rebuild his reputation. During the next two years, 50 Cent returned to the rap underground where he began. He formed a collective known as G-Unit, worked closely with producers Shaw Money XL, and began churning out mixtapes. These mixtape recordings earned the rapper an esteemed reputation on the streets of New York. Some of them featured 50 Cent and his G-Unit companions rapping over popular beats. Others mocked popular rappers, especially Ja Rule, who quickly became an arch rival. Ja Rule was a mother ink. So it's crew versus crew. So mother ink on one hand and 50 Cent on the other. And it's like, again, I'm sure it was all over Ja Rule being a pop rapper and not being quite, you know, excuse my language, street enough. I think that's an interesting thing. This one piece will make 52 layers. Watch on mobile devices or the big screen. All for free. No subscription required. This constant mixtape presence throughout 2000 to 2002 garnered industry attention as well as street esteem, particularly when Eminem declared on a radio show his admiration for 50 Cent. A bidding war ensued, driving up the signing price into the million plus figures in the process and slowly moving the rapper into the up and coming spotlight once again as word spread. Despite the bidding war, Eminem indeed got his man, signing 50 Cent to a joint deal with Shady Aftermath in collaboration with Dr. Dre. During the successive months, 50 Cent worked closely with Eminem and Dre, who were both credited as executive producers on his upcoming debut, Get Rich or Die Tryin'. 50 Cent's debut album was built up as one of the most anticipated rap debuts of recent times. Get Rich or Die Tryin' was released in 2003. It debuted at number one on the Billboard 200, selling 872,000 copies in its first four days. The lead single, In the Club, set a Billboard record as the most listened to song in radio history within a week. It's kind of a landmark in a way because it paved the way for what later happened in hip hop, which was people dealing with people who had been in jail or people who had been shot, that you had to have some sort of reputation before you were even allowed on the mic. With the backing of established rap stars such as Eminem and Dr. Dre, the album was almost inevitably an international hit, and 50 Cent was noted for his graphic records that didn't hold back in outlying the trials and tribulations he'd gone through to get to this point. I think you go back to Snoop and his emergence in the early 90s, and you find the first archetype of uh, the, the rapper turning their real-life situations, their trials and tribulations, literally, in Snoop's case, is his trial, into uh, fuel for the art. And here's 50, who's had even more drama in his real life. Uh, and clearly, by that stage, this was not just a, an, a normal and an expected thing for a rapper to do, but actually probably commercially advantageous. And I think this is the thing that, that 50 did, uh, that other people haven't really learnt from as fully as perhaps they might, is how they can then take what's unavoidable, what's happened to them probably through no fault of their own, tragedies, tribulations, real life problems, uh, and turn them into something that he can then make work for him. He did that brilliantly through his music. As well as portraying his life in his lyrics, 50 Cent was also keen to deliver his tale to the big screen. He starred in the biopic Get Rich or Die Tryin', which was released in 2005. The film went on to gross over $45 million worldwide. It's important for the music business, not just 50. 
It's a great movie. It's a powerful movie. Jim Sheridan really put some heart and soul into this thing. Fifty did a great performance along with the other, the other cast members. And I think it's very, very important for the music business itself, this movie. Anybody who's been through any hard times ever can, can associate themselves with this film. It's just that simple. Because if you've ever been through any kind of struggle, or if you ever had any questions about who you are, finding yourself, that's the same struggle and the journey that this character Marcus goes through and the rest of the guys in the film. 50 can do anything because he'll study, he'll train. He's an athlete. He's a, just a brilliant musician. He's a great songwriter. He's a great, great lyric writer. And he's a very powerful person. Oh, man, I enjoyed myself. It was a learning experience. You know, I got a chance to learn a lot being on a set with Terrence Howard, Joy Bryant, Bill Duke, Omar Miller, Tori Kittle, Ed Wiley, to name a few. I mean, in, in the future, if there's a, a screenplay that come, I come across that's as exciting as my life story is to me, I'll commit to it, you know? He's great. He's great. He's like a sponge. He soaked everything up. Whether it was a suggestion from the director, from a fellow actor, he was very interested in getting the best possible performance out of himself and us. It was fun. I mean, the cast, the crew was real nice. It was cool hanging out with 50. He's a real nice guy, very respectable. I kind of picked up some of his traits and his mannerism. So if I start drop, if I drop a rap right now, please forgive me, it's 50 talking. I mean, it's an opportunity for people to get a good look at what the things I've been through in my life and make a decision on how they feel about me as a person based on this, opposed to the small things they receive through different media outlets. Did you know back in the day? They're gonna be very surprised. Fifty Cent made his group debut with G Unit, Beg for Mercy. The album charted at number two and spawned a couple top 15 hits, Stunt 101 and Wanna Get to Know You. After the successful release of Get Rich or Die Tryin', 50 Cent stayed on the sidelines for the most part as G-Unit affiliates Lloyd Banks and Young Buck released popular solo albums. Another G-Unit affiliate, The Game, released his debut in January 2005 and it proved to be the most successful among these solo spin-offs, in particular the singles How We Do and Love It or Hate It, both top five hits that predominantly featured 50 Cent. As these singles were riding high on the charts, however, 50 Cent and The Game were feuding and the latter was acrimoniously booted out of G-Unit. It's built into the language of hip hop that you diss all the people. You know, you diss their clothes, you diss their shoes, you diss their moms, you diss all of that. You know, but you do it wittily. And that's what you're supposed to do. It's always been a part of hip hop culture. They started calling it beefing after Tupac and Biggie. You know, and the, the culture is so competitive in hip hop, you had to be prepared to battle at any time. If you were an MC, which stands for microphone controller, you were able to, to get on at whatever point and you would go back and forth and saying who could actually rock a crowd better than the other. In March 2005, 50 Cent released his second studio album, The Massacre. Nearly as popular as Get Rich or Die Tryin', The Massacre debuted at number one and went on to sell over 10 million worldwide and spawned a series of smash hits including Disco Inferno, Candy Shop, and Just a Little Bit. When you release your second album, the knives are out. No matter who you are, the knives are out and then you have to doubly impress people. By the time it came to Massacre, um, which I reviewed at, for The Enemy, it was something slightly different. Dr. Dre contributed, but he didn't do the whole album. And 50 Cent obviously intentionally did that because he wanted his own identity separate from a producer's identity. But I remember that I gave it seven out of 10. And in, with hindsight, it should have been more because it's actually, it's a more enduring record in its own way than get rich or die trying. The massacre tends to get thought of as being a, a in second place, if you like. It's the second album. Uh, we also didn't sell as well as the first one, and, it, and people tend to think maybe it, it wasn't as successful. I, I would argue it's uh, creatively uh, a much more successful record. There is a, a, a broadening of the themes. Um, 
a deepening of the attitudes that he brought to his music, the, the relentless focus and drive on making it as uh, work as, as meticulously and, and as smoothly as possible. Uh, there's some big songs on there that have become anthems. Uh, it was a success, it didn't sell as many copies and I don't think that's the way to judge it. I think it's a better record. It's, it's a record that would actually endure but all he is speaking about on that record is once again massacring other MCs. <laughs> After robbing other MCs, now he's going to massacre them. You know, it's, it's, it's hip hop. After firmly establishing himself as a hip-hop powerhouse in the mid-2000s, 50 became a business, scoring his own G-Unit clothing line, his own PlayStation game, and even his own vitamin water flavor. On Forbes magazine's 2007 list of hip-hop cash kings, 50 Cent, worth $32 million, ranked second behind Jay-Z. When you go back through 50 Cent's musical career and his biography and his life story and all of the things that he's done uh, creatively and commercially, they're all interlinked and they've all been about maximising potential and uh, turning himself into a brand uh, was, it was already somewhat established within the hip-hop world by the time he came around. There were, uh, we'd had the, the mid-90s uh, the emergence of the idea of, of hip-hop groups or hip-hop artists as being people who could sell t-shirts or baseball caps or uh, perhaps start to help market training shoes and get deals with sportswear firms. I think you go back to Run DMC who were very influential in, in 50's career instantly. Jam Master J was a, an early mentor. Uh, they were the first people to, to really sort of uh, bring the idea that hip-hop could help sell things like sports shoes. Uh, and they made that a mainstream thing. And branding, uh, being uh, successful financially beyond the music, beyond the creativity, ha was already a part of the, the landscape when 50 came along. So it's natural that he would have had one eye on that. And I think it's in keeping with the way that his music went and the way that his career developed following the shooting. Uh, he became somebody who was driven by achieving and achieving in whatever way he saw fit and whatever way he felt was logical and whatever way he could make work. Uh, so the, yes, it's surprising in some respects that he became a multimillionaire through vitamin water, uh, not through something that might at first glance appear to have more direct resonance or relevance to his rap career. But if he saw an opportunity, he would take it and he would maximize it. And I think that's, uh, that's all of a piece with the music that he made. While 50's profile remained high, his modus operandi of get even richer or die trying had a deleterious effect on his music. In a bid to increase sales for his third studio album, Curtis, 50 Cent went head to head with Kanye West in a sales battle that would ultimately represent the changing attitudes towards hip hop. He too had an accident, you see. He too had an accident, and he started out as a producer anyway, and he wasn't supposed to be a rapper. Oh, you know it happened for a reason. God knew I had a message, he knew I had a mission, but he knew no one cared about me. He said, Kanye, I'm gonna make somebody care about you. Bam, I nearly died. That's one of the best things that could happen to a rapper. The sound of Kanye, Kanye, is, he's a producer, so he's like, he, he uses a lot of 808 drums, which goes back to the beginning of hip hop. It goes back to the electro era. He's a big producer, but 50 Cent, he's, he's a rapper and he doesn't produce his own stuff and he has to farm his stuff out to, pro to producers. And that's just, you know, it becomes a big difference between them. A Kanye record is glossy, glossy to the nth degree. You know, it, excuse my language but it's glossy. And a 50 Cent album is like grimy. So yeah, it's the difference between glossy and grimy. By the time he had his uh, face off, if you like, with Kanye West uh, uh, over releasing an album in the same week and, and making this big song and dance about who was going to sell more and, and putting high stakes on it. Uh, I think the industry had changed, the music industry had changed. 
uh, hip-hop was changing, hip-hop has constantly changed since it started, uh, so that's no surprise. But the, the economics of the music industry were starting to crumble. Uh, we were feeling the effects of uh, the, the downloading, the MP3 era, uh, the idea uh, that by now is entirely prevalent that music is not necessarily something that you should buy, uh, it's something that you hear and you should have free access to it. Uh, Anybody coming around in that era was going to see lower sales than they had be, perhaps been used to in even four or five years beforehand, certainly ten years beforehand. Anything that could galvanise audiences and get people to actually think about buying records was therefore something to be uh, savoured and to be applauded uh, in the boardrooms, if not necessarily uh, in, in the clubs, as it were. To the general public, the pairing seemed like David versus Goliath, with the G-Unit leader towering over his production-centric counterpart from Rockefeller in both stature and pop status. 50 Cent claimed that if Kanye outsold him, he would never make music again. I think what 50 Cent did uh, during that period with, with Kanye was nothing so much than execute uh, a very uh, shrewd bit of marketing. He made it into a prize fight. Uh, if you support me, buy my record. If you support Kanye, buy his record. And I'm sure that Kanye would have interpreted it in that way as well, that 50 was actually helping him sell his own record. Kanye West went on to defeat 50 Cent in their much-hyped SoundScan clash, pushing 957,000 copies of Graduation against 691,000 copies of the G-Unit Stars album, Curtis, it doesn't surprise me that he then continued to make albums afterwards because there's all sorts of ways you can spin that. He's like Humpty Dumpty in that regard. He can make words do whatever uh, he wants them to do. Uh, did he sell more records? Maybe he, he would argue that he sold more over a longer period of time. I don't know. Or he sold more singles or he had more downloads or he had more views on YouTube. There's some, there'll be some way in which he could say that he won. Um, or just the fact that he sold a lot of records, that's winning enough. After the Kanye West saga was laid to rest, 50 Cent was keen to further explore his acting career. He landed a role in the action thriller Righteous Kill along with Hollywood A-lister Robert De Niro and Al Pacino. Oh man, uh, in spite of the character I'm playing in the actual film, is, it actually has a bigger role than people understand. Until I actually see the film, they understand it, but it's like, um, I, I think that the project itself was so exciting that I can't even focus to tell you what I think about the character. So many people, you see, I'm nervous. And I'm never nervous, you know? So was it nerve-wracking working with Pacino and De Niro and guys like this? Well, yes. You know, I think I think anyone would have would feel that energy at some point. You know what I mean? If it ain't coming from them, it'll be coming from the people in the room that make you feel that way. You know, so I, I actually had the opportunity to be acquainted with Robert a little more than Al Pacino, but you know, Al's a good guy too. And so what was the experience like working with him? I mean, did it just make you want to be a better actor? Okay. It was great. Like, I mean, I felt like I did a great job. If you ask them, they'll tell you I did too, because I, <laughs> you know, but it worked out. The whole, the whole process was great. It was an amazing experience. So to go from Get Rich to Die Trying to this type of movie, I mean, what is that transition like? Well, I mean, since this, I've, I've shot a film, Microwave Park, with myself, Val Kilman and Sharon Stone. I did uh, Home of the Brave, myself, Samuel Jackson, Jessica Bill, Brian Presley, and, you know, a few projects that I'm proud of. I actually wrote, produced, and directed my first film, and it'll be out like late November before I self-destruct. On its opening weekend, Righteous Kill opened at number three, grossing just over $16 million behind The Family That Prays and Burn After Reading. Well, I think police officer movies generally have criminal activity. People enjoy the action in those actual films. I mean, and we, we have confirmation constantly from our news publications, and away from it actually being in the UK, confirmation will come from the web where you get a chance to see that these things go on in the environments that they're making reference to. So it's like watching a film that's based on someone's true, a true story or someone's life story is interesting even if it doesn't run parallel to yourself.
Away from the big screen at the studio, 50 Cent is keen to give back and is involved in numerous charities. In 2007, the space formerly known as the Baisley Park Community Garden began its remarkable transformation into the Curtis 50 Cent Jackson Community Garden. Giving back to his childhood neighborhood and the community that has supported him over the years, rap sensation 50 Cent joined forces with the NYRP founder and performer Bette Midler to breathe new life into this much needed green space. This is great. I'm, I'm thrilled. I'm thrilled. I've been watching him. He, he, what, what, what he has achieved in five years is absolutely astonishing. And the, the foundation that he has, the G Unity Foundation that he has, is, a, is devoted to doing, to giving money to, uh, to granting money to organizations that already exist that need a, a little hel a helping hand. And some of them I've seen the list, and it's a, a fantastic group. So we knew he was serious, and when we came to him with this project, you know, it started out as a $250,000 project. It somehow wound up costing us uh, a little bit more than that, and he never said, boo. He just said, oh, oh okay, anything you need, and because uh, I think he's really devoted to the neighborhood, and I think he's really devoted to the, to the idea that the kids have a place to come and learn about where food comes from and, and, and what's, what's great about nature. So it's win-win. It's, it's beautiful. If you look around, I wish I had it to come to when I was growing up around here. That's exactly what I was just gonna say. I mean, th this is where you're from, so how does it feel to give back to the community? It's exciting that, to be a part of it, period. Like, I mean, it's an opportunity to be a part of actually upgrading the neighborhood and actually experience the living here. Absolutely. Now, how did you guys hook up with Walter Hood to, de to design the project? My organization is New York Restoration Project, and my or the, the head of my organization is Drew Becker, and he knows almost every top landscape architect in, in our country. And I have to say that Walter Hood is one of the foremost. And he's never designed a garden here in New York City. This is his first garden. So we are like, I'm sure the magazines are gonna descend upon us because it's, it's first of all, it's sustainable. This is a rainwater collection system, these blue things here. There's a gigantic tank underneath the garden that holds the water. We have pumps, we're gonna have solar. We do programming, we have show movies, we have, you know, festivals. It's, it's just, it's fantastic. I, I really hope the kids love it. I know the grown-ups are going to love it because they really get it. They've been on this garden for, for about 30 years, so they get it. The kids, is brand new to them. They're going to, they're, I think they're going to have a wonderful time here. And any plans to do any other gardens in Queens? I don't know. What do you well, think? Yeah, I think we need to get busy. <laughs> what do you think? We can do a lot of stuff. We can do we a should. lot of different things, you know, but I'm excited. Like, there's an a, a annual day that goes on down in 40 Projects every summer that didn't really happen this year, so I'll be sponsoring that next year, so... Fantastic. Thanks, guys. I mean, this is beautiful. Thank you very much. We're very Thank proud of it. Located in the Jamaica section of Queens, the garden represents a much-needed resource for an area that currently has less than 5% of the recommended amount of open space to serve its more than tens of thousands of children residents. Wow. I couldn't have a better introduction than that, right? You know what I mean? But I'm going to start off by saying I feel really good being here to just get a chance to see some of y'all faces. I see John Fool, Zaya, a bunch of y'all, man. I didn't even know Lefty was out of jail, baby. What's up, man? <laughs> man. But it's just a, it's a hell of an opportunity for me to be able to collaborate with Bette Miller and uh, New York Restoration Program to bring this garden to the community to allow the youth, the little guys that were singing today, the opportunity to utilize it. Because they're going it, to, they'll, they'll utilize it a little more than the adults. You know, we got bills to pay. You know, so for them to have this, this opportunity to, to utilize it is, is great. You know, I feel like to be able to directly affect the experience of living here for them is exciting. You know, and also, you know, while I got the, you know, the mic and I'm in front of everybody, you know, I'm, I'm looking forward to doing even bigger, better things in the actual community in the future. So they can look forward to it. They can say this is the first thing that happened. You know, you know I already started in, in investigating, and I, I'll actually, well, this year, we'll actually experience the first, uh, 50's first annual 40 day down in 40 projects. and. and and also 50's first annual Baisley Day. You know, see, because we haven't had the opportunity, you know, to be honest, it's just the money ain't around here the same way it used to be, baby. So we got to get it from somewhere else. You know, so 
We're gonna make it happen the way we've been making it happen, right here. Thanks for coming. After sharing screen time with some of Hollywood's biggest stars, 50 Cent was back in the studio working on his fourth studio album, Before I Self-Destruct. Initially, Before I Self-Destruct was planned to be 50 Cent's 2007 album, for which he completed 12 songs. However, he decided to release Curtis instead, and as a result, Before I Self-Destruct's release date was originally pushed back to 2008. In a red carpet interview, 50 Cent stated that while he was working on the album, he wrote, produced, and directed his first film, saying that the release of the film would coincide with the release of the album. Though a track list appeared in early January 2009, 50 Cent later stated he reworked much of the album. The album was released exclusively on the iTunes store on November 9th, while the physical copy was released in stores on November 16th. 50 Cent told MTV that he named the album Before I Self-Destruct because, quote, it could potentially happen. 50 Cent described the album as darker and more aggressive than his previous album and stated, quote, hands down, it will be the best record of that time period. The album sold 160,000 copies in its first week, debuting at number four in the United States. By 2009, you're really talking about a, a completely changed landscape for, for the marketing and, and selling of music. And uh, if 50 Cent has uh, one key attribute, it's as a great branding, marketing, uh, selling apparatus. He's a, he's, a, he's a man machine when it comes to precision tooling his output and making it as successful as possible. Now, before I self-destruct, certainly didn't get the numbers that his earlier records had achieved, but then how could it? It came out in an era where so, so many uh, people were accustomed to getting music for nothing and they weren't interested in buying <clears throat> albums by anyone, never mind who it was that was making them. Uh, the numbers that it did therefore have to be seen within that context and it's hard to argue that it wasn't as successful as other records of its type even if it wasn't as successful as other 50 cent records had been in the past by this point in his career the movie offers were flooding in he accepted a role in the gritty british crime thriller dead man running alongside danny dyer and tamer hassan a lot of projects Well, things that kind of speak to my lifestyle, you know, so I pass on things if it don't, like if I wouldn't actually utilize it or understand why a person would want it, I won't be involved in it. And the film project, Alex, the director came out to talk to me about the project and he, had, he was really impressive. Like him, he was more impressive than the script initially because I didn't get a chance to read everything there. And then there was, uh, the slang in the actual script that was like, I don't understand this part. So he had to kind of explain to me what it was actually about. And my character was originally written British also. And then he met, made the modifications and uh, it made perfect sense for me to be a part of it. Then I had a chance to see uh, Layer Cake and the business prior to him actually coming. So when he told me that it was Danny and Tama, it was exciting and then I thought it was an amazing, they, they pulled off uh, the, the hat trick when they got Brenda involved. You know, that was the, the key piece that made it like, okay, this is a real movie to me. You know what I mean? Like, this is gonna be hot. And then, you know, it, it came it came out like I expected. You know, I, ju I just wanted to be a part of the projects that have artistic integrity that I want to be associated with. You know, so I feel really good about this. It was not about how much they was paying me to be on the project, you know, because people associate me with my business and that business savvy, I'll point that out because when it comes to film projects, it, it's the film itself that's important. Well, I mean, for me, creatively, I have to be inspired by what I'm reading, you know, and I don't look so far into it to say I won't play this role because it'll create this this type of image or aura for me, you know, like you might see me in a romantic comedy. Don't expect me to just play in things that 
directly speak to 50 Cent. This is why I asked to be called Curtis 50 Cent Jackson in the film project, so my fans don't come to see the film and expect to see the, the same aggression that's on the actual music. What's interesting is uh, people already see me really, really aggressive. You know, so I, I think I'll be accomplishing what, what I really need to accomplish by them seeing normalcy within my character and them seeing, uh, I played a police officer in uh, Streets of Blood. I played uh, a soldier in Home of the Brave. You know, it's the intensity of the war setting that attracted me to that project because there's no bigger life-threatening situation for you to be in than in, on the actual battlefield, you know, so those projects. And then Righteous Kill, Al Pacino, Robert De Niro is a completely different role, you know, but it is, it's different kinds of aggression involved in those actual films. And I think we all have it at different points. Does Randy help you as an actor? Well, I'm, I, it helps you develop a comfort in front of the camera. Prior to you actually starting to, to act, you can become extremely comfortable, you know, speaking in front of the camera. It becomes the third person in the room. You know, that you don't actually have to pay very much attention to it and still be natural. Fifty Cent's fifth album, Street King Immortal, was initially scheduled for a summer 2012 release and postponed until November 13. Disagreements with Interscope Records about its release and promotion led to its temporary cancellation. Its first promo single, New Day, with Dr. Dre and Alicia Keys, was released on July 27. The song was produced by Dr. Dre, mixed by Eminem, and written by Fifty Cent, Alicia Keys, Royce to Five Nine and Dr. Dre. My Life, the album's second promo single with Eminem and Maroon 5 lead singer Adam Levine, was released on November 26, 2012. In January 2014, Jackson said he planned to release Animal Ambition in the first quarter of the year, followed by Street King Immortal. On February 20th, he left Shady Records, Aftermath Entertainment, and Interscope, signing with Caroline Records and Capitol Records. According to 50 Cent, although he owed Interscope another album, he was released from his contract because of his friendship with Eminem and Dr. Dre. I'm a special case in situation. It's also because of the leverage of having the strong relationships with Eminem and Dr. Dre. They don't want me to be uncomfortable. They value our friendship to the point that they would never want to jeopardize it over that little bit of money. That day, he announced that Animal Ambition would be released on June 3rd and released its first track. The song Funeral was released with a video on Forbes.com. Produced by Jake One, it is a continuation of 50 bars from a previous album. Two more tracks were scheduled for release on March 18th. At South by Southwest in Austin, Texas, Jackson performed Hold On from the new album. That song and Don't Worry About It were released with accompanying videos on March 18th. According to 50 Cent, prosperity would be a theme of the album. This project I had to search for a concept, a really good concept in my perspective, and that was prosperity. I outlined all the things that would be part of prosperity, positive and negative, for animal ambition. On May 14th, 2015, 50 Cent revealed in an interview that the first single from Street King Immortal would be previewed Memorial Day weekend and would likely be released in June. 50 Cent released Get Low on May 20th, 2015 as the lead single from his sixth studio album, Street King Immortal. The song, produced by Remo the Hitmaker, features vocals from fellow American rappers 2 Chains and T.I., as well as American singer Jeremiah. So, a new record in 2016, it's going to be an interesting listen. Uh, I, I don't know what to expect from that. Uh, I don't think anybody knows what to expect from that outside, uh, outside of 50's camp. Street King Immortal, new 50 Cent album, should be very interesting, as usual, because if he says he's immortal now, once again, he's gone beyond the limit set. You don't say you're immortal because you're, you're then challenging people to actually take you down. But 
he, he's not going to be taken down. I think, I think he'll be good. I hope he works with Dre, but I think there's so many young blood producers now that he doesn't necessarily have to work with Dre. He doesn't have to. And um, he'll pay them. And if, if, if he had to deal with Dr. Dre, there would be a slight clash. There'd be a clash because both are now major domos in their own empires. And, you know, they'd have to come together and kind of knock heads a little. Looking at 50 Cent's career, one would hardly expect that the rapper's impressive rise to stardom could have been cut short by an early life of crime and violence. As a musician, an actor, and a businessman, 50 Cent has consistently proven his instincts for choosing successful projects in which to involve himself. However, 50 Cent was actually born into an environment full of poverty and bloodshed, and had to fight his way out of a deadly cycle of incarceration and physical confrontation before he truly realized his full potential. The difficult points define how good it is when, when you make it back to the good points in life, you know, so you don't give up based on it being rough, you, you work through it and get to, then imagine how good it's going to feel when it feels so bad at that point, when things get better, you know, like, even now at this point in my life, if I didn't go through the things that I went through in the past, it wouldn't feel the same, you know, the things you go through turn you into who you are. He came to prominence in an era where it was already understood that if you wanted to get fans of certain subgenres of hip hop, you needed to make sure that there was something for them on your record. There'd be something for women, there'd be something for people from the South, there'd be something for people who had more affinity with the West Coast style, something more lyrical and gritty for people who'd grown up with the traditional East Coast Golden Age sound. Uh, and he would put all of those things onto his records and the people around him, Dr. Dre, Eminem, knew as well how to bring all of that out and to put it all on a record so that there was something in there for everyone. But he also did that with his lyrics and he did that with the song uh, themes and the structures. And it was uh, a precision tooled piece of work that he was able to manufacture uh, because he wanted to make sure that it would reach as wide an audience as possible. Whereas many rap artists have often been critiqued for rapping about harsh subjects of which they possess little knowledge, 50 Cent lived the dangerous escapades he would later put in his songs. Although a rise in the higher echelons of Hollywood mellowed out his confrontational behavior somewhat, 50 Cent's early life began with a whirlwind of tragedy and treachery. And as a result, the multi-platinum selling artist's music depicts a gritty painting of his turbulent life. But is he considered a hip-hop great? I don't necessarily think 50 Cent is a legend of hip-hop, period. He's more of a legend for accruing money than he's a legend of hip-hop. I don't necessarily count him as a legend of hip-hop, but he's contributed great work over the years. He's contributed absolutely brilliant work, but he's not one of the legends. He, you know, and that's what he's striving for. He wants to be the king. He wants to be, you know, actually put it this way, he wants to be Elvis Presley. 50's place in hip hop history is an interesting one. And, and it, it, it's, it, it's difficult to see exactly where he's going to fit uh, when, when people are looking back 10, 15, 20 years hence and, and uh, considering the competing merits of the different people of the era that he's been a part of. Certainly he's been one of the most successful, uh, uh, commercially successful artists to come out of the genre. Has he been one of the most uh, critically acclaimed? No. Has he always made art that will rank alongside the greats that will resonate down the ages? Not all the time. There are moments on, on his records and in his career where he stands shoulder to shoulder with, with the all-time greats. Perhaps not as many of them uh, as would necessarily be needed to have him admitted into that upper pantheon of the all-time giants of the genre. And in a funny sort of way, perhaps the 
creative work that best exemplifies what he's about and that, uh, that I would consider in, in many respects his greatest artistic achievement is his autobiography, his book, uh, which really does nail uh, aspects of hip hop culture, uh, the ideas that rappers use, uh, the drive and the motivation behind people to make this kind of music for that kind of audience in this era. Uh, he tells that better in the book than maybe he did on some of his records. Now, one could argue that means that the records perhaps don't deserve to stand uh, among the greatest of all time. Or maybe it means that the records are actually better than we all thought they were at the time because we've now got this expanded context in which to place them. Uh, and we can see him perhaps more clearly as, uh, a, as a more fully rounded artist rather than perhaps this, uh, this very driven uh, slightly calculating, perhaps slightly cold uh, persona that we get from just the records on their own. I create goals for myself and as I accomplish them I move on to recreate new goals for myself. I think I'll always be finding something new that I want to do. It's just it's who I am. I just want to do, I have to have something that I'm passionate about and that I'm focusing on in order to be happy. You know, and I move from one project to the next project to the next project. If there's nothing going on, like vacation for me is two days. I only need two days. After that, I start looking around like, why am I stuck here? <laughs> when I'm on an island, wherever I'm at, I'm like, wait a minute. This is too much here. Like, what are we doing? Like, and it, I don't know if it's from the way I was brought up, but I, I got to kind of be involved with, you know, things, uh, what's going on and what I'm working on. He's had an interesting few months. We've seen him win all sorts of plaudits and, 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 and significant critical acclaim for his acting in, in Southpaw alongside Jake Gyllenhaal, which is interesting in itself because I, I felt that uh, uh, while he was fine enough in that film, he's, he's been better in other films without people really taking that much notice of him. Uh, so that's good. He's got that the acting thing starting to pay off for him, I think. Uh, maybe we're going to see a bit more of that in him. Maybe he's got some stories that will feed into his music that have come from his uh, absorption in, and, and establishment in that world. Um, he's also declared himself bankrupt. And uh, again, I, I wonder quite what the real story is there, whether we'll ever get to the bottom of it. There's a history, uh, a, one would hesitate to call it a tradition, but there's a, 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 a certainly a, a route in the United States where people can use the I think it's called the Chapter 11 bankruptcy procedures to essentially separate themselves from uh, financial situations that they'd rather not be a part of. And I, I don't know whether declaring bankruptcy implies you don't have any money. Uh, I don't think that necessarily applies in this case. Uh, but he's going to have to address that. I think his fans would expect him to address uh, that in, in this record. He's obviously someone who's uh, conspicuous success over the years has been a big part of the brand that he's built uh, following his first album and for him not to at least start talking about why he went into bankruptcy and what that was for and maybe either either in a couple of lines dismissing the notion or uh, joking about how he's been able to pull one over on on people who were financially after him and out to get him and he's now run away and stash the loot somewhere. I don't know what his... I would expect there will be something in there and uh, it's going to be very interesting to hear how he, uh, how he tackles the, 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 uh, the changing narrative that he's been a part of over the last uh, couple of years. So it's me sharing another portion of my experience in my life. That's been what my entire music career was about. Writing things that I've experienced, seen and been exposed to or subjected to on some level. So it just was, for me, uh, uh, the next level in presentation. Whatever path 50 Cent chooses to take, and with a new album on the way, fans of the New York rapper can look forward to their idol being around for many more years to come. <laughs>